Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's Implementation Science Seminar. Um, this is hosted by the Columbia University Clinical and Translational Science um, Irving Institute, as well as the New York State Psychiatric Institute. And I'm so pleased um, to be here today with my colleague, Dr. Taryn Swindle. Um, so Taryn is um, an associate professor at uh, in, in the family and preventive medicine within the College of Medicine at University of Arkansas for biomedical sciences. She's going to be talking with us today about community de-implementation, feeding practices in early care and education. And I think this is actually our first seminar on de-implementation, so I'm thrilled that you're here to talk to us about your work. Um, Dr. Swindle's research program focuses on understanding and improving health and developmental outcomes for children impacted by poverty. She has a particular focus on obesity prevention and nutrition promotion for young children in low-income families. So with that, I am very excited to turn it over to Dr. Swindle and welcome to everyone um, that's joined us this afternoon. Thank you, Sapana. It's a treat to be here. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you all a little bit today about the work we've been doing in this space. I'm going to walk through some different projects, so it's not just one project, but kind of where we've been and where we think we're going with this work in community de-implementation. So I want to acknowledge my collaborators first. I definitely could not do this work without Julie, Rut Julie Rutledge, who is a, a close partner of mine and collaborator at Louisiana Tech University, Jeff Curran, who has been a mentor for me and a collaborator here at UAMS, and then Susan Johnson, who is an expert in child feeding research and works out of uh, UC Denver. I want to also provide the funding and financial disclosures for this project before we dig in today. All right, so a little bit of background uh, is that many, many children are in child care on a daily basis, and they eat a lot of meals there. Over 500 times a year, they're having sitting down to a meal a lunch, breakfast, snack with their, the providers in that setting. This matters because the way adults feed children ends up impacting their growth, their BMI, the way they are able to self-regulate at meals, as well as the dietary preferences that they develop. Our prior work shows that educators, though, are 10 times more likely to pressure a child to eat than to cue them to hunger and satiety. So if you've been in a child care setting before, or maybe if you have children of your own, phrases like, I need to see you take a bite, that might sound familiar, or please, please eat. Um, but maybe we're less likely to ask children questions like, how's your belly feel? And do you still feel hungry? So when we think about de-implementation, it's really important to be clear about what we're trying to stop. And oftentimes we're trying to replace that with different behaviors. So Every single thing on this slide has an evidence base behind it, and I'm happy to discuss more on that, that detail, but these are the things that in our work that we want to see started and stopped at mealtime. We would like to replace any negative comments about foods with positive ones. As I mentioned, we, we want to see less pressure to eat and more cueing to hunger and satiety. Less of this, you know, you got to eat like Johnny over there <laughs> and more of just a positive, encouraging approach to trying. There's a lot of hurry that happens at mealtimes in the school and ECE environment. And instead of that, we'd like to see space created for exploration of foods. And also you might hear folks say things like, oh, don't touch that. It's sticky or, you know, you're making a mess. Uh, actually, that's a very developmentally appropriate behavior. And we instead might want to coach a child through that experience of, what are you learning about that food? What do you smell? What do you taste? So I'm going to start by talking about an RO3 that we had. Actually, I'm going to go back just a minute. So here in the corner, I haven't introduced her yet. That's Wendy Wise. And Wendy is a cheerleader for healthy habits in the early care and education environment. We have a curriculum with Wendy. She introduces fruits and vegetables to children. And there's some evidence-based practices of that intervention as well. The reason we got interested in the implementation is that we were able to see improvements in role modeling behaviors and use of the mascot and exposure of fruits and vegetables. But the evidence-based practice of WISE that we just couldn't get going was positive feeding practices. And so we started to think, you know, maybe we've got to remove 
some of the things that teachers are doing before there's space to add uh, some positive feeding practices. So that got us really interested in writing an R03 to do this. So we wanted to develop an approach for a de-implementation of detrimental feeding practices. And we wanted to do that in partnership with uh, folks in the ECE setting. And then we wanted to begin to collect data on whether it was feasible, acceptable, and had the effects in the direction that we hoped. So we thought that if we were able to um, remove some detrimental practice, that we would be creating space for adoption of evidence-based practice. So we use a few theories, models, and frameworks in this work. First, I Paris. I like to use this a lot in my work. It's very intuitive to me uh, in terms of the constructs that includes. And so we use that to guide our initial qualitative work. We sat down with a lot of teachers and asked them questions about why is it hard to, you know, avoid pressure to eat at mealtimes? What about the place that you work tends to contribute to that practice? Things like that. We also um, we use the mo Niven model for de-implementation. I'll show you in just a minute. Increasingly in implementation science, I love process models because it's step by step walking you through what you might need to do to think about an implementation or de-implementation effort. And then we use REAIM to guide our evaluation efforts. So this is that Niven model. I hope it's large enough to see for you all. What I wanted to share with you with this is if you start at the um, actually the bottom with assessing current use of low value practices and then move left, you can see how we were thinking about studies would build one another to e execute this full model. So we had some preliminary work on the prevalence of these practices. Then we started to assess context and barriers and a KO1. And then this RO3 that I'm telling you about was looking at selecting and tailoring strategies and evaluating it. But then also doing that in a larger scale trial and sustaining it, we're looking at that work in a future R01. So I, I, probably many of you on this call are also soft funded researchers who write grants a lot. And um, for me, this process model was really helpful to think about how we could structure and strategize the studies to build upon one another. So this is the stakeholder panel that helped to advise our work. This consisted of two directors in the early care and education space two parents, two um, five lead teachers, three assistant teachers, and then a couple of panelists from our Arkansas site as well who acted as mentors. They had been on a, a process like this before, and so they mentored our panelists through this. So we took them through an evidence-based quality improvement process. The first step that we did with them was say, you know, we've got a lot of data on bearers and facilitators to use of, of good feeding practices, help us prioritize it. And so they, they walked through a card sort activity with us to do that. Once those priorities were set, we did an intervention mapping approach to take their priorities and map them to potential implementation strategies. We took that back to our partners and said, what's feasible of these options? Which ones are most important? And they rated those using a go zone concept. The ones that they selected as highly important and highly feasible, we started to mock up. And so we did some prototypes of these things, which we again took back to them for their feedback before we did some refining and piloting of the materials. So just a little snapshot of some of the results that, that we came away with. They had these priorities when it came to uh, evidence-based feeding practices. One teacher, and you can see how we mapped those to the IPARIS constructs as well. So at the context level, um, they're talking about how a lot of the children they serve may not have enough food at home. And so that puts a lot of pressure on them. And then at the recipient level, they talked about not knowing the difference between some of these practices and in, in you know, real time in their meals. They talked about not believing that children were able to do some of these skills, like know when they're hungry and full, and that they um, didn't have this awareness of how to gauge these things at their mealtime as well. So when we, and those were some of those key priorities. So we, we took this back to them with some potential strategies. Here were some of the examples that they, they rated. So would it help to audit and feedback teachers on their practices and mealtimes, or maybe remind them of good feeding practices? And also what about doing some sort of peer-to-peer -peer practice? And all of these ended up being ones that they rated highly and we prioritized. 
This is the full set of strategies and where it landed in terms of the specification. I'm not going to read the words, but you might want to see the full package we were working with. We had a dynamic training, which was improvisation based. So that was a lot of fun for me to learn improv. But because the, this feeding practice thing is so culturally bound and personal to, to educators, we wanted the training to be very fun, very light, to create an opportunity to be open to change. And, and we saw that. We did end up going with a peer learning collaborative model because again, we want that social comparison, the social norms to be at play. All of this was undergirded with external facilitation. So all of our, our teachers had a coach. And then kind of the neat thing is that they got to pick which strategies they wanted to support them in their start and stop goals. So they could have picked environmental reminders, expert recommendations, educational materials, or audit and feedback. So they, they had that choice. For the first semester of the school year, they chose their start and stop goals to work on. For the next semester of the school year, we suggested them based on data that we had about their mealtime practices. So this was the evaluation that we had planned. We were going to be looking at impacts on children in terms of their BMI, their carotenoid intake, their fruit and vegetable intake. We were going to be looking at the feeding practices that were used at meals using observations, as well as self-reports. We were also going to be thinking about that intervention fidelity I mentioned to you earlier, because we saw these feeding practices just competing with that intervention. And we wanted to see if the, these practices or these strategies would help. We also were interested in whether these things could be maintained over time, the effects that we were creating. And we got interested very much in how relationships were a mechanism for change or not within the context of, of, of these strategies. Okay, so this is not a surprise. All of you on, on the webinar today have faced this in your, in your research. COVID just really messed things up. So this ended up being the reality of, of our evaluation. So we had just done our midpoint collection in January, and we were gearing up for the final endpoint in April and May, but schools all closed in March of 2020. So we were only able to do comparisons from our um, baseline data around August or the prior school year and January right before COVID. So we were able to look at feeding practices, relationship quality, and perceived barriers in 25 classrooms with our midpoint being the end point. We did see some promising things. The inappropriate practices or detrimental practices they were using at WISE lessons decreased by three, and they were able to increase their evidence-based practices by five. So that's a net improvement of eight practices within a short amount of time. These lessons are about 15 to 20 minutes long. And at meals, we were also able to see a decrease in their use of inappropriate practices by an average of five. When we think about some of the mechanisms for why this might be working, we did see improvements in the relationship between the co-teachers and we did see decreases in their perceived barriers to implementation of, of the WISE intervention. So while the data are limited, we felt like this contributed to a few conclusions. We can improve the adoption of evidence-based practices with this package. We can decrease the use of inappropriate practices. We can support educators' relationships with one another and remove barriers perceived to the innovation. And of course, COVID-19 just stinks. All right, so we were kind of stuck with this incomplete data in hand and not really ready to write the next grant and wondering what can we do now? So we're still very much stuck in COVID and everybody knows it lasted quite a while. So we wrote a CTSA pilot to take those strategies and deploy them virtually. So what you're looking at is the virtual platform that we created for our package of strategies we called Wise Words. None of the folks on my team are web developers. Uh, and so this was a, quite a learning process for us to think about how can we put these, this goal setting process, this peer learning collaborative, these resources online for teachers to be able to access when we cannot go to them. Because even though childcare wasn't closed very long, they still kept us out actually until October of last year, we could not go back into the classroom. So we did some PDSA cycles to test this approach online, and then we piloted it in 24 classrooms. We did a few things to evaluate it. 
Some of these will look familiar to the RO3 evaluation. We wanted to evaluate the training, so we moved improv to virtual. That was challenging. We also wanted to see how they were thinking about this online intervention. Was it acceptable, feasible, and appropriate to them? Did they change their feeding practices? And we did something new. We had them audio record their meal times instead of us being their law to code them. And then we were also able to track how much time they spent on the platform and then interview them at the end of the process to get their feedback. So detail here is not important, but just to show you that every one of our PDS, PDSA cycles had a different goal in, try, in terms of trying to get this move to the online platform. We were really interested in, can we get people on? Will they connect with their coach? Will they connect with each other? Will they, uh, what barriers and facilitators will they have to engagement there? And so we were doing some iterative testing and, and through these cycles before we went live and we had some promising indicators we thought it was going to work. We were able to get all the teachers online. We were able to get most of them accessing resources and linking up with their coach. We did see challenges trying to get them to connect with each other online. That didn't work as well. And there were some barriers with the uh, platform as well. But when we went live with the training, we, we saw a number of positive things. They thought it was fun. They thought it was memorable. They thought it helped them to learn the concepts. Uh, and very few of them were uncomfortable. You know, if you're put into on the spot in an improv class online that has the potential to be uncomfortable, but few of them claimed that that was the case. And they felt like most of them felt like the points of the training were clear. So some examples of what they learned was, I learned instead of asking children over and over to eat, I can just ask them if they're full. I don't have to insist that they eat everything. And that's exactly what the, the example of what we wanted them to walk away with. Some things that were challenging, you can, you can see there that they needed a computer and a phone or a laptop to, to be able to do everything during the day of the training. This is because we were trying to get everybody live on the platform at the same time of teach them how to do that. That was very challenging. And, and, a, and a key barrier of the training. But they did walk away understanding the schedule of the intervention, understanding its goals, and finding it appealing. In terms of usage, we had 49 users with 20, 247 logins. They did uh, five per teacher on average, with no teachers logging on in November, December, those holiday months. So that was short of our goal of getting them on the, on the platform monthly. You can also see some of the goals that were selected um, most frequently by them. They, they selected for themselves that they wanted to work on asking children questions to support food exploration. And they wanted to work on stopping asking children to eat more. When we recommended goals to them based on their data, we most frequently recommended helping children know when they're hungry and full. And just like them, asking children to eat, uh, stopping asking children to eat more. So no significant change over time in feasibility, acceptability, and appropriateness. And, and this is a case where I think no change is a good thing. After training, we asked them these questions and we asked them again at the end of the year. And so they had eight months of exposure to the, to the platform and their feelings about the intervention didn't get worse over time. So that was promising. We were also to able to observe some changes in the things that we cared most about. We saw a 56% decrease in use of inappropriate practices at meals and a 50% increase in evidence-based practices at meals. Their self-reported um, behaviors didn't have a lot of change rather, other than undermining autonomy. One caveat here is we did have a low return rate on those audio recordings. We were only able to get about a 50% return rate on our recordings which speaks to the challenge of doing this hybrid and virtually based research. In terms of our qualitative feedback, we saw that there were some barriers. They have competing priorities in their classroom, as you can imagine, during COVID. They talked about being overwhelmed. Not only was it COVID, but they had to start this new literacy training and they had these licensing things that were happening. It was just all a lot. Um, they also felt like, and this was different from our in-person uh, approach. When we went virtual, we saw a dip in their uh, perception that they were getting the feedback that they needed. They felt like they didn't hear from us. They felt like that um, in some cases, they didn't know what they were doing, that they needed to get the feedback that they wanted. And so that spoke to a shift in the virtual uh, piece. 
We did see some key facilitators. They felt like it really did help with positive communication at their meals. They learned new ways to talk to the children, encourage them, have conversations. And that was very encouraging. Um, they also felt like when we were able to support them with the technology, it helped them a lot. So even though we couldn't go into the centers, you would find us on the road driving to parking lots frequently in masks and helping teachers in the parking lot figure out how to troubleshoot their login or access something on the platform that they were having a little trouble with. I will say in the early care and education setting, it's not very common to need to access technology during their day-to-day -day practice. And so this was a new behavior we were asking them to engage in. So thinking about this virtual pilot, here's some conclusions I would have. We again felt like the training, facilitation, and educational resources were memorable. They were received well, and we seem to have some indication of effectiveness. However, it was hard to maintain that initial engagement, especially during those busy holiday seasons and as the school year uh, kind of went on. We also found that relationship building is very hard to do virtually. In our in-person work, our coaches, our facilitators, they had good relationships with these teachers. They um, started to learn things about one another at a personal level and really have connections. That is hard to do when you don't have eyeball time, just very hard. So we're thinking a hybrid approach might be able to offer the flexibility that we would need to, be, to, to leverage the successes of both of these projects. So the next step is that we have an R01 under review. So we're going to be looking at, or if, if funded, we would be looking at if we can do um, delivery of those resources online, but still have a coach going in about once a month. So less frequently than at first, but just once a month to say, how are things going with your resources? And can I help you with any technology barriers? And tell me about your successes. We're also going to be studying in that work, again, if funded, if trust is a mechanism of change, if building relationships matters between the teachers and between the coaches and the teachers for seeing um, our, our de-implementation strategies work. So I'll just say before I move to questions, and I did want to leave a lot of time for discussion and questions today, that I get really excited about this in terms of implementation science because you see most the implementation work in clinical settings. Let's and, and it's great work. Let's remove opioids. Let's um, do better with antibiotic stewardship. Let's, um, you know, those kinds of clinical initiatives. Less frequently is that that we're trying to do de-implementation work in a community. So I think what we're learning is really interesting and hopefully applicable to other community settings that you uh, do your work in. Thanks, Darren. Really interesting work. 